he has generated in excess of $400 million. I'll repeat that number just so we can understand. $400 million in leads for his clients on LinkedIn. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the undisputed king of LinkedIn, Nathaniel Bibby. So she was saying it hasn't been easy, my journey, and it's not just been at the start. I started my business when I was $20,000 in debt, couldn't pay my electricity bill, was getting evicted, had lost my job. What else? <laughs> Didn't know how to fill up my car full of petrol. And I started a business in that environment. And I don't think I would have started that business if I didn't have that desperation at the time. And so people think like it's just been rosy since then, and it's not at all. Like with the um, LinkedIn Heroes series, has anyone seen the interviews that I do with entrepreneurs at all? A few of you, so I interview entrepreneurs that are making an impact, and it's always been a challenge for me to like get more famous and accomplished entrepreneurs. I'll get a call and they'll be like, oh, you know, come to Sydney to interview Grant Cardone tomorrow, you've got to be here at 2 p.m. And I say, yes, okay, sure. And I get a flight at 7 a.m. the next day, and in this scenario, I got to the airport and they're like, oh, didn't you hear your flight's been canceled, Mr. Bibby? I said, well, what do I do? And they said, well, you just go into the customer service queue, which of course is the length of half of the terminal. I finally get to the front of this, this queue. They said, oh, you're on a flight at 7 p.m. I said, that's too late. I need to go interview Grant Cardone, right? <laughs> Digging, you know, there's no flights, there's no flights. I'm like, yeah, but if there was, you know, how do we get there? And they finally said, I can get you to Adelaide. And there's a flight that leaves from Adelaide to Sydney five minutes after you land. We can't connect you on the flight because it's too close. It's called an illegal connection or something. So we can only get you to Adelaide, then you're gonna to have to run to the gate and you may or may not get on the flight. I'm like, okay, book it up, you know? And so like, I get to Adelaide, run to the gate, get on the flight, and then I, it will finally get to, to Sydney. And I've got about 45 minutes before I have to interview Grant. And I went to the bathroom in the airport and I looked at the mirror and I was just like, oh, you look like shit. <laughs> so I ended up like, like having a shower in the international terminal, using my t-shirt as a towel. Anyway, this is the sort of shit that, that goes on, you know, behind the scenes to accomplish all of these things. Like people think, well, what the fuck are you doing all that for? What are you getting out of it? And I'm literally, all I'm doing is interviewing him and adding value to my network. I'm not selling him anything, it's not a business deal. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. And I consistently like, especially with the, things like speaking gigs, my view on it is, if I, if I can do it, I do it always. Because I think that you learn so much through your practice of actually doing it. I think that it's something that you don't lose just when you've, like just because you're making money or just because you've got good clients, just because you've got um, less competition. I think business is about overcoming challenges. Today, we're gonna to talk about the seven steps to growing your influence on LinkedIn. Most of my clients, they make their revenue through lead generation. So we find people in their target market, connect with them, set up appointments with them. Pretty straightforward. And I was offering this service for about five years, but I was posting content. And as I was posting content, I was finding that there was less competition and I could like raise my prices, I got better value clients. And I was thinking, how do I offer this unique thing that I can do for my business to my clients? And so I've, it's, it's really complicated. There's a lot that goes into it. And I've just chunked it down into seven steps that I think any of you can accomplish. So this is really about content marketing, how to position yourself as a thought leader. So the first year or two that I was posting content, every single person I do business with, all my friends, all my family, are like, what the hell are you doing all those videos for? You know, like, how do you make money out of that? What, why do you go interview like Vic Kerwin Ray or whatever? What are you trying to accomplish? And I didn't really have an answer, you know, for the first two years. So, so I felt like a bit of a dick most of the time. And then after about 18 months, I started to get to a place where, like I call it blue ocean, right? Where there's no competition. Because what used to happen is people would contact me and they say, we're looking for someone to do some LinkedIn training for us. We're speaking to you, we're speaking to this person, we're speaking to this person, what's the best price you can do? And then they sort of weigh up between the three proposals. Um, it doesn't really happen very often at all now. You know, if, they want to, if they're talking to me, normally they're just talking to me. And they're not really too fussed what the price is. And so then I was like, okay, now I know what I'm doing. But most people, that's way too long to take, get a result for them to stick at it. You know, so this stuff is not like the lead generation where you can get money in the bank tomorrow. This takes longer, but it's more worthwhile. So the first out of all the seven steps 
is, is strategy because if you don't know what your objective is, how the hell do you know, you know what you should be posting and what, what sort of content you should be delivering? Like, is it to build your brand? Is it to generate leads? And if it is to build your brand, like what kind of brand do you want to build? Because if you don't know, how the fuck is the audience going to know? It's really important that you're crystal clear on what your brand is if you want your audience to understand it. What do you think the average social media engagement rate is on a post on average? 0.1%. So what does that tell us? That just tells us that the people that are posting content are not delivering it in the way that people want to consume it. The usage of social media is going up. So even though people are crap at delivering the information, brands still want to consume the information there. So there is an opportunity, but not many people are taking advantage of it. Just because they're on social media doesn't mean that they're communicating effectively to their audience at all. Because it's a new form of marketing. Social media is very, very different to any other form of marketing. It's social. The, the clues are in the name, right? Because if something's social, it, it means that the person that you're communicating with doesn't have an established need or an established problem yet. So if you start selling to that person, you're going to ruin the relationship straight away. There's something called a mere exposure effect, which basically states that the more time somebody is exposed to your brand, the more that likely they are to trust you, the more familiar they are with you, and the more likely they are to do business with you. And it used to be five exposures and that's enough. Now it's 23. So I think of social media like, how do I get 23 exposures in front of my target audience so that they see me enough to want to do business with me or trust me enough to do business with me? You can fuck this up because if you send 23 exposures in front of somebody with a call to action, you're just going to piss them off. No one's going to enjoy 23 exposures to a call to action. So you have to do it in a way that adds value through education, entertainment, inspiration, and things like that. And that's pretty much where most people are going wrong. Even if they think they're adding value, because our human needs now are met so much through social media, they're not aware of the fact that they're actually doing it for self-serving reasons. It makes people feel connected, makes people feel significant. A lot of people project onto the world their, their own problems. That's why there's so many life coaches out there that don't have a life, right? I'm being judgmental. So the goldfish thing, um, the attention span, of course we're being bombarded with all these different messages all the time. So people's choices are going up. We've got all the choices in the world, but we've got less time. In order for any of this to work, you have to make a decision whether or not you're going to be focused or unfocused. On social media, most people are unfocused. They wake up in the morning and they're like, oh, I need to do a post today. What shall I do about? It's the most inefficient way to do social media you could possibly think of. So if you're unfocused, you're reactive, you're not in control, you're unsure about the future, you have no breathing room, you're flustered, you're second guessing, you're surviving, you're basically yeah, reactive and you procrastinate. So whereas if you're focused, you've got more of a longer term vision, you're quite calm because you know what you're posting tomorrow. You don't really have to think about it too much and if you want to change it up, you can because you've got a plan in place, you're confident, you can easily make decisions, you know what to say no to. When somebody sends you a connection request, do you have a system for how to accept or not accept? Or do you literally think about it every time somebody sends you one? If you're focused, you love taking action because you know what you're doing. And so this is the first decision that I need you guys to make if any of this is going to work. Because I do, I've been doing these seminars a long time and before LinkedIn I was doing them about Google AdWords and it was SEO before that and I've done a lot of sales training and stuff. And no matter how good the feedback is, less than 5% implement any of it. They don't take action. It's a lot of it's to do with confidence. They're scared of making mistakes. I can't do any of this stuff for you. It's a decision that you have to make yourself. And I, I hate planning shit, like I really do. But when it comes to this area, I have to. A lot of my life um, has been like luck or grace or um, taking advantage of one opportunity, but this is not one of them. This is a systemized process. So that means that any of you could achieve the same results that I have. But you just got to, first of all, you got to learn the system. That's the easy part. Then you got to actually put in the work. So how, like how bad do you want it is the question. Because like, I was in the Startup Grind APAC conference two days ago in, in Melbourne. And the, um, the guy asking the questions, the MC said, but I run a business, you know, like I don't have time to spend half an hour a day on social media. And I was like, well, you can't do it then. You've got to spend, like, I spend two or three hours a day responding to people's comments on my posts. It's a lot of time. There's no way around it. I mean, there is ways around it, but then you're going to come across as inauthentic. Attention. Has anybody heard of um, Gary Vaynerchuk in the room? Cool. 
You guys seem like a well-educated crew. It's interesting, right? Because I watch Gary Vaynerchuk all the time, and sometimes when I ask that question, like, when one or two hands go up, I forget that, like, if you're not in that space, okay, that's a cow. <laughs> so I went down south a few months ago for my mother's birthday, and I saw lots of these things. I uh, hadn't seen them in a while, so I didn't take this photograph. This one's off Google. But if, if I saw one like this, I probably would have stopped and taken a photograph. <laughs> Does anyone know the book Purple Cow, by any chance? A few of you nodding? Seth Godin, I reckon, is one of the best marketers that's ever lived. Um, and he talks a lot about being remarkable. The reason that he talks a lot about being remarkable is because you, if you're unremarkable, in other words, boring, nobody's going to talk about your business or your brand. Now, on social media, it's not about delivering information. It's not about education. The successful social media marketers focus on conversation. Because if you have a conversation with your target audience, not only are you engaging them and you can actually have permission to, to have a deeper uh, discussion with them, but you're also learning what they want. You're learning their needs. These days, the expectation of the consumer is so much higher than it was five years ago. And unless you're like actually learning, it amazes me people post content and they get like two comments on their post and they have not responded to them. Like those two comments are the most important part of your whole, whole content marketing strategy on social media, responding to those two. It's about the relationship you have with your audience. Everyone's like, I need more followers. What do you need more followers for if you're not even looking after the ones that are following you? What the hell would you do with 10,000 followers? You're gonna not look after 10,000 people? If you had 100 people and you're responding to all of their comments, you could build a much more successful business than if you had 10,000 followers that you ignore. There's a few ways that you can add value through content. In fact, there's four, and there's only four. So on LinkedIn, what's interesting is education and inspiration. Some information stuff is, is pretty natural to share, right? Entertainment would crush it on LinkedIn. If somebody was actually funny <laughs> and they did, delivered comedy or something like that, it would, they would crush it because no one else is doing it. With, with um, social media, it's not about doing what everyone else is doing. It's actually the opposite. When people say to me, oh, LinkedIn is just full of salespeople and sh the content shit and everyone's in engagement pods, I just know immediately that they're one of those people that have logged onto LinkedIn and they look at who's requested a connection request from them and they click accept, accept, accept. They may even reject a few, but the fact that that's the focus of building their network means they're reactive. They've got no say over who's in their network. And you do that on Instagram, but you don't have a choice. Like on Instagram, people follow you. You can't decide who follows you. Oh, can you come and follow me, please? Whereas on LinkedIn, you can. You can be the proactively sending connection requests out to people. If they accept that connection request, they see your content. So how targeted can you be with your audience on LinkedIn? Extremely targeted. So if a client comes to me and they say, the financial advisor is a great example. I say, who's your target audience? He goes, anyone with money. Okay, well, that's the first thing we need to change. Because how can we be so targeted and so focused if we don't even have a target market? Become the medical specialist in financial services. Make that your headline. Every time you send a connection request to a dentist or a doctor, they're gonna see you're a specialist. Oh, that's interesting. And then eventually they'll see that you've got 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 connections in their industry. And then they develop what they call fear of missing out, which is one of the most powerful tools in marketing. When the iPhone comes out, they plan it so that it sells out. Like that's how you get people talking. That's Apple's purple cow. In Melbourne, there's these nightclubs that there's these massive queues out the front when you drive past. You go, oh, that must be good in there. You just wait in the queue for an hour and a half. You get inside, there's no one in there. <laughs> but it works. If you know Gary Vaynerchuk, you would know about jab, jab, and right hook. So jab, jab is basically like add value, add value, add value, and the right hook is like put in your call to action. It's almost at a point now where there's no right hook. You're jabbing consistently, and if somebody wants to buy from you, they will get in touch. Like if you make it relatively easy for them, there's no need on social media to tell people what to do next on every post. Yes, do it on a website. Yes, do it in any other form of marketing because they already know there's a problem and they already know there's an established need, but do not do it in a social environment. Like, we don't do it at a networking function to go up and say, hi, you know, my name's Nathaniel, I do LinkedIn marketing. By the way, if you want some LinkedIn marketing, like, go here, do this. No. People are just going to think you're a dickhead. Context is probably the most underrated thing in social media. 
People think that adding value means giving something that is of value in a way that you want to describe it. And it's, it's, it's really not. Like it, adding value is having enough empathy to communicate in a way that is consumed by the person that you're communicating with. So if you do a video post on LinkedIn, 10 seconds into the video, people press play. If they get that far, it's to press play. 10 seconds in, on average, 50% of your audience are not watching anymore. 10 seconds. After a minute, it's 80% of people are not watching anymore. So when I started like posting videos, I mean, I wasn't very confident. Like I was sort of like pushing myself into it. And I got hung up on like, spent all this time on Fiverr, like getting this like awesome intro video with like hip hop music and like me walking through St Kilda and then like meeting these like celebrities and like, I don't know, all this rubbish. And I was like, that is sick. Nobody gave a fuck about, like I was losing people because they wanted the content. They didn't want to see me like gallivanting around with my sunglasses on. They're not interested. Don't do the old intro video. Like it might make you feel more confident, but no one's going to watch the content. There's only one thing that you can guarantee that people are interested in, and that's themselves. And so you have to create content that's going to help them. And, you, and if you don't know them, like if it's on LinkedIn, because it's all organic, you're serving the top of the customer journey. They just don't even have an awareness that they need what you offer yet. So the way that you build trust and you wait to start a conversation that maybe leads to a conversation about your business is you have to go really simple and really high level, solve their easy needs. You have permission then to solve the more complicated ones as well. So much content out there, we don't need more of it. What we need more of is good quality content. I do a lot of tests to see what people remember from my content. Like I did this post where I was like, I'm going to wear a Biggie Smalls t-shirt at my LinkedIn versus Instagram tour. And I didn't wear it. And so I was like waiting to see who remembered, right? No one remembered. One person, I think. So I, th I think that you could post the same content every three months and no one would remember. Like, I don't think you just change a few words. You need to be repetitive because other people will just forget this. They're getting so much information. So I, I suggest creating one big, like rock solid piece of content, an ebook, and you can use that to create all the other small micro bits of content. Similar experiences and emotions. Does it always need to be about your business? Yeah. When you go to a networking function, do you always need to have a conversation be about your business? It's actually easy to build rapport if you talk about something that's got nothing to do with business. It's still a touch point. When people go into a meeting, these are normally the brain chemicals that they're experiencing. Or when somebody's exposed to a piece of content or somebody gets a message from a stranger. Cortisol and adrenaline. These are the stress chemicals, right? So it makes people intolerant, irritable, uncreative, critical, makes their memory terrible. They're critical, they make bad decisions, bad decisions and stress. So when you communicate with your audience or you generate leads, or even if when you go to a sales meeting, you do not want people to be releasing this chemical in their brain. So you really have to shift them out of that very quickly. And you can do it through storytelling. So dopamine is one of the brain chemicals that you can create through storytelling very easily. People love stories. It's very easy to create dopamine. One of the most powerful ways to do it is through intrigue. So has anyone ever heard somebody tell a story and not finish it? It's quite annoying, right? What, what you're experiencing in, in that moment is high levels of dopamine and you want to know more. That's what you want to create with your brand. It's not a good idea to tell everyone all the information because then you've got no control and they don't want to know more. So in some respects, not talking about your business could be a great way to create intrigue. Oxytocin. Um, my sister's just had a baby boy and she's got lots of this flowing around at the moment. <laughs> People want to be generous when they're experiencing oxytocin. So if I told you a story about how I started my business and how I was in $20,000 in debt and I didn't know what to do and my electricity wouldn't, uh, was cut out that night and I called my mum and like, asked her to borrow some money and she said no. And I'm sitting in my dark apartment thinking, this is rock bottom. And I share that story with you guys. And it's true. And it's, it's a vulnerable thing for me to share. I've been practicing it, so it gets a little bit easier. But what it does is it creates that oxytocin because you relate to it. Endorphins. If you're funny, be funny in your content. This is awesome. Endorphins makes people focused, relaxed, and creative. 
you ever been to a meeting? It was like that when I met Shil the first time, where it was an hour and a half just passed like that. We just kept talking over each other because we had so much of this going around. We didn't even know what we wanted to do together, but we just knew we wanted to do something. Didn't we? So this seems a bit counterintuitive, right? Stop selling. What you'll find is that if somebody has the problem that you solve, is anybody in B2C? I think most of you are in B2B, aren't you? Is anyone in B2C, business consumer? Yeah. Yeah, cool. What, what do you do? Do you mind me asking? Marketing agency. Marketing agency, okay. So you solve problems for customers, right? So if somebody has the problem that you solve, they do want a solution, like they do want it fixed. So if they knew what you knew about your product, they want to buy, they do want to buy, but they do not want to be sold to. So what I want you to think about is how do you help somebody buy, not try and sell them something? The first thing you have to do is not sell to people that don't have the problem that you solve. You have to have a discussion with them to find out if they have the problem or not. Then you can offer the solution. You, do you know, if, if you find out what somebody's problem is, if you ask them enough questions about it so that you understand it at their level, deep enough, they will just assume that you have a solution. They'll be the ones asking you about your service. I guarantee it. You don't, if you define the problem somebody has better than they can, they will assume that you have the solution. Does anyone recognize this chap? Grant Cardone. That's right, Grant Cardone, the guy that um, sent me on a wild goose chase around the country. <laughs> I, I thought he should have sent his um, private jet to pick me up. But... So monetize is, a, is one that's interesting because people go, well, you're not talk, selling on social media. What are you talking about? How do you monetize? But if you don't do this component, it won't be sustainable. You have to be, if you're adding value, you should be making a lot of money. Right? Because that's just the way that we exchange value in, in this modern world. If you're not, like it's probably because if you feel like you are adding value, but you're not making enough money, I reckon that you need to put your prices up. The best piece of advice, well, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever received was from Jack DeLosa. And I got up and I told him, look, clients get these awesome results, but after like six to eight months, they kind of just cancel because of other reasons. It's got nothing to do with with what the service we're delivering. And he said, uh, how much do you charge? I said, two grand a month. He goes, how much did you uh, start with, uh, charge when you started your business? I said, two grand a month. He goes, are you better what you do now? I said, yeah. He goes, he goes I would triple my prices, but I want you to at least double them. And he was, and he's spot on. Like, of course, we had the added benefit of making more money, but clients stay now for 18 months because they value the service more and we were able to deliver the service that they expect, if that makes sense. Because it's not just about delivering, I always thought it was about delivering leads and results and sales. It's not. It's about the account management, having enough empathy to make sure that they understand what you're doing every step of the way. Because people do not like surprises. Anyone that ever tells you that they like surprises is lying to you. <laughs> they like good surprises. People generally don't like surprises. So this is another fascinating thing, which is like really obvious when you think about it. But 90% of businesses fail within five to 10 years. So if you're doing what everyone else is doing, you're fucked. This is a guaranteed way to lose in business. 90% of them have gone in five or 10 years. So you've got to be doing what like very few people are doing, and most people will tell you you're an idiot for doing it because people have a bias to what they're already doing, right? People don't want, like, they have a bias to what they're already doing. They have a bias to what their beliefs. Um, most of the things that I do in my business, especially in marketing, is very different to what everyone else does in Perth. You know? I post five times a day on LinkedIn. Well, if you post five times more, you will get five times more exposure. Do you um, get overwhelmed or do you find new skills and resources to be able to deliver at a higher level? If, if you want to survive 10 years, that's kind of what you need to do, not just in marketing, in all areas of your business. Marketing is probably one of the most important areas. There's only three ways to grow a business. More clients, higher transaction size, and getting people to buy more often. I've thought about this a lot, and this is, these are the only three ways. I think what most businesses do, and I certainly did this at the start, is when you're thinking about how to grow your business or how to make more money, you sort of just focus on one. And for me, it was more clients. I always, always wanted more clients, more sales. That was always my solution to everything. And even if it worked, like I'm only focusing on one area, so I miss that like um, compounding effect. So this is how some of the numbers could work. So if you get, in a year, 12 new clients, 
your average sale is $10,000, and they buy twice, you're bringing in $240,000 per year. If you increase the number of clients to 16, I mean, if everybody put their mind to it, could they increase the number of clients that they sell to over the next 12 months by four clients or 30%? Average sale goes up by two grand, so 20%. Like if you really put your mind to it and you spend like half a day like brainstorming, could you figure out a way to put your prices up by 20%? people buy 0.5 times more. So over two years, they buy one more time. It's quite possible. Then you've doubled your revenue because you've done all three areas. And it's not long before you're at a million bucks just by making a few slight changes in each area and not just focusing on one. In the old days with marketing, you're very limited to how many of these areas you could affect. But with social media marketing, if you do this whole content marketing and thought leadership thing, you can impact all three of them. How cool is that? This is Alan. Alan resembles what a lot of people do on LinkedIn. And I, don't, I have no judgment of what Alan's decided to do on LinkedIn. I have empathy for it. But I want to explain to you the mentality behind most people, why they join LinkedIn and what, you know, what traps they fall into. This is basically all of the mistakes wrapped up in a little story about this dude from The Hangover. Alan starts by updating his profile. So LinkedIn will suggest that he updates his profile. He's got a CV, so he puts a lot of experience that he's had in his career up there. Then uh, he gets a lot of connection requests. So he, before he know it, he's got over 500 connections and he's telling people, oh, my LinkedIn's so good. Like, oh, I've got over 500 connections. Then they have discussions and he starts meeting up with some of them for coffee. This is so cool. Like I've got all these connections. I'm meeting up with them for coffee. Then he starts posting some content on a daily basis about what he's up to with all these people that he's catching up and got like some sort of relationship with. Then he's not happy with engagement. So he's looking for ways to hack the algorithm. And then one guy says to him, do you want to join a group of other content creators? And every day we post a link in the group. And if you like our stuff, we'll like your stuff and we'll comment on your stuff as well. And he's like, oh, wow. So now he's getting like 100 likes on his content and 50 comments. because And then he's liking and commenting on the people in his network as well. Does that make sense? He's hacked the algorithm. He's using manipulation tricks to get engagement. And so if you look at his profile, you think, oh, yeah, this guy's pretty active. He's getting a lot of engagement, right? Can people see the problem with the story? He's got a CV on his profile. So if you're communicating with your customer, your CV is one of the most boring pieces of information that you could possibly give them. Like if you ever bought anything because you walked into a shop and they're like, oh, here's my resume. Sorry? Is he after a job or after clients? Alan's after clients. Why is CV after? Exactly. Exactly. Because he doesn't know any better. Like that's what LinkedIn's suggesting for him to do. It was actually created as a Rolodex of CVs, by the way. There's more salespeople and marketers on there now than there are people recruiting for jobs. It's, it's awesome. This is, the opportunity is so awesome because LinkedIn let, never anticipated this market. So their products suck. Like, they're OK, but they're not very good. Like Paying for email so you can message people that you don't know and adver advertisement is, is like a 1%, 2% conversion rate. You connect with people and build a relationship with them and, and send them a private message, which is free. It's 15 to 40% conversion rate if you do it properly. So the problem is he grew his network by being reactive. He's accepting and rejecting, not requesting. Why? Because he doesn't know what to do. Like he doesn't know how to use the advanced search feature. He doesn't know who his target audience is. So he's being reactive. So LinkedIn, if you think LinkedIn's like crap because you get all the sales letters, it's just a result of your network. Like if you just cull everyone and only connect with dentists, you're going to get a lot of content from dental practitioners. But if you're reactive, the chances are most people that are going to send you connection requests are either salespeople or recruiters, or they want to go on a date with you, or you know, they've got some like, self-serving interest in connecting with you. They're not necessarily going to be your potential clients. Or, yeah, tie kickers. Like, so people that if want to catch up with a coffee with you because they want to sell you something, they want to recruit you, or they've got nothing better to do. You have to be a little bit careful about people that have got too much time on their hands. Coffee after coffee and coffee after coffee. He's sharing content, but he's sharing links to content off of LinkedIn. He's sharing other people's content. 
he's seeing crap content in his feed because all of these people are in the same boat that he is. So he just thinks that that's how you post on LinkedIn. That's how you post on LinkedIn. He does not seeing any of the good content. So LinkedIn is spam. This is the way to get ahead. You join an engagement pod. Now, along the way, what's happened is he's created all these biases. So if somebody comes along like me and says, get out of the engagement pod, change your profile, what you're doing is wrong, he's going to defend that naturally as a human being. Because this is like his livelihood, he's got a sense of pride with the fact that he gets loads of likes and loads of comments, but he is not making any money off social media at all, and he's spending a lot of time on it. <laughs> 